Hack Attacks Illustrated, Mr. Robot. In this series, I will examine the hacking attacks from the TV show, Mr. Robot. We're going to start at the very beginning at Ron's Coffee. So I started intercepting all the traffic on your network. To illustrate intercepting traffic, or packet sniffing, we first you look at how things normally work. In our example, we have a wireless router, two computers, and a server. We'll say they're nice user one, nice user two, and facebook.com. So normally our nice users connect using Wi-Fi to the router. The router connects to the internet, and Facebook is also connected to the internet. Before we go on, I need to explain a packet. All data that travels over any network does so in frames or packets. A packet is exactly what it sounds like. It's like a package or a letter. It has a from address, where the package is coming from. It has a to address for where to deliver the packet. And sometimes a packet will be chopped up into pieces, so we have a part field that tells us which piece is which. And then we have the message proper. So in our example, this packet is coming from nice user one to facebook.com and it's part one of one and the message contains can I have Anne's profile Facebook then replies with a packet from Facebook to nice user one and this one is chopped up so it's part one of 22 and the message contains the first part of Anne's profile so the first packet travels in the form of radio waves over a Wi-Fi connection to the router and then travels over something like ADSL to the internet and to Facebook servers. Facebook then sends a packet back through the internet, the router and the Wi-Fi to nice user one. So here's how it works. One of the problems is Wi-Fi signals go everywhere. And unless there's some kind of scheme to stop it, someone else can see or sniff those packets. And that person can have access to everything sent or received from the victim's computer. But what if you're not using Wi-Fi or have something like a switch that stops the packets going everywhere? That's where ARP cache poisoning comes in. So in this scenario, we have the switch and all the other equipment on the network, the internet, two nice computers, and a not-so-nice computer. So every computer has a MAC address burned into its hardware used for short-range communication on the local subnet. Since I'm simplifying here, I'm going to shorten that address. The first computer has an address of AA13. The second is AA47. And the attacker's MAC address is AA93. When AA13 wants to communicate with AA47, it creates a packet with the address AA47 and sends it on its way. So when it wants to communicate with a computer on the internet, the internet can't deal with that. You need an internet protocol address or an IP address. So let's give them some IP addresses. We call the first one .1.12. The second one will give an IP address of .1.96 and we'll give our attacker an IP address of .1.212. What happens when someone wants to talk to another computer nearby using an IP address? Here we have a packet for .1.96. What happens is the computer just asks everyone nearby who is .1.96. Or to put it another way, what is the MAC address for .1.96? The computer with the address replies with its MAC address. 
and the first computer just makes a note of it in the ARP cache, essentially a list of IP addresses that go with the MAC addresses. The problem is it's all based on trust. The protocol is very naive. So when a first computer asks who is .1.96, our attacker simply lies. It shouts louder than the genuine PC shouting, I'm .1.96. The first computer records the false information in the ARP cache, and the ARP cache is now poisoned. Any packet going to .1.96 actually goes to dot one dot one one two our attacker and our attacker can then forward those packets so that our victim does not suspect that there's something going on it can also do the same thing with the router so what should go through the router actually goes to the attacker which then forwards the packets to the internet this is what we call the man in the middle effectively traffic moves like this Everything goes from our victim to the attacker, then to the network, and to the internet. And the attacker can intercept or sniff passwords, emails, credit card numbers, or bank details. I own everything. All your emails, all your files, all your pics. Of course, there are encrypted tunnels like HTTPS that would prevent an attacker from sniffing. But there are ways of circumventing that too. That's a topic for another day. You're using Tor networking to keep the servers anonymous. You made it really hard for anyone to see it. Tor, the onion router, is a way of disguising where your network traffic is coming from and going to. It's called onion routing because the packets are encrypted in layers, like an onion, with layers being stripped off and new ones added as it passes through the network. Let's take the example of a user in an oppressive country. We have a computer, we have the internet, and we have a website hosting disgusting Western propaganda, like BBC News. All our users' traffic goes through Patriotic ISP, who keeps an eye out for dissidents who are interested in this voting thing, and passes that information on to the Ministry of Truth. So when our dissident sends a packet to disgusting Western propaganda site, the ISP forwards a copy onto the Ministry of Truth, and the Ministry of Truth doesn't like what it sees. So... How does it work with Tor? The Tor network is a series of computers on the internet using the Tor software. This time the Tor software encrypts the packet, passes it through the ISP onto the Tor network. And this time the Ministry of Truth receives the packet but can't read it and doesn't know what its destination is. After that, the packet is sent on to a series of Tor relays where it's bounced around, stripping and adding layers of encryption until it reaches an exit node somewhere else on the internet, beyond the Ministry of Truth's control, where it's sent without encryption to a disgusting Western propaganda website. But I saw it. The onion rooting protocol, it's not as anonymous as you think it is. Whoever's in control of the exit nodes is also in control of the traffic, which makes me the one in control. Overall, it's a pretty good system, but it's not perfect. The Ministry of Truth could start running its own exit nodes. And if they set up a lot of exit nodes, then the odds become pretty good that the dissident's traffic comes out of one of their exit nodes the ministry will be able to see what's happening. If they see that a packet was sent at 9.11 p.m. and its size was 128 bytes, and on the other end they see a packet arriving at 9.11 p.m. and its size is 128 bytes, they could put two and two together. So far we've talked about using Tor to hide that our dissident is going to a website on the normal internet, but 
it's possible to run a server, a Tor service, from inside the Tor network and not send anything in the clear, unencrypted, through the normal internet. Thank you very much. These concepts are intentionally oversimplified, but I look forward to your comments below.